Hey there, I am Reverend Cooper and I am bringing you a book discussion on Lauren Winner's Mud House Sabbath, an invitation to a life of spiritual discipline. And uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about how I came to find this book. Um, Lauren, as an author, was introduced to me by a really good friend in seminary, and as I read one of her first books, I really enjoyed her style of writing, and so I began to read a lot more of her work. And then, in my first call, um, as an associate pastor for member care in Missouri, I had the opportunity to work with Lauren on one of her most recent publications called Wearing God with the ladies of my church in bringing a women's retreat to them focused in and around that book. And so she and I had the opportunity to spend some good time together and it helped me to understand her voice a little bit more. Um, to have the opportunity to talk with her in person over the course of a weekend. So uh, it's with joy and excitement that I share some of her uh, wisdom ponderings with community as my new church and I look forward to hearing what you all have to say. I thought what I would do is just to walk through the introduction a little bit so that we can get an outline of what she's saying. And then I'm gonna raise some questions and share some thoughts about those questions. And I'll do the same with uh, the first chapter as well. And so let's go ahead and get started with the introduction. So Lauren's clearly saying that as a converted Christian from Judaism, that she misses the practices of Judaism. And she's honest about the fact that she believes Jews do spiritual practices better than Christians. And so we as Christians or Gentiles, if you want to use that language, have something to learn from these Judaic practices. And she then goes on to create two columns, as far as I see it. There's one of action, and there's one of faith. And the Judaic tradition falls under that column of action. And she argues that the action of observing these rituals and spiritual disciplines helps to engender faith in this sense those practices and those rituals themselves train us in the ways of the spirit so that um, when we have high holy days in our lives or we have the mountaintop spiritual moments that she talks about i think most of us are familiar with as um, the moments when we would encounter god in phenomenal ways, uh, ways that are, are not ordinary by any stretch of the imagination, but they are moments like when Moses uh, was atop the mountain and got the Ten Commandments heralded down to him from the heavens, those kinds of mountaintop moments, mountaintop moments like when Jesus went atop the mountain and was transfigured, these completely different, distinct kinds of experiences that we can identify as none other than spiritual happen, you know, once in a lifetime for some of us. Some of us, they never occur. Others have them much more regularly. But her point is that the practice of spiritual discipline would help to prepare you for those moments. And one could argue then that a mountaintop moment might be better able to be found within one's lifetime or repeating it within one's lifetime if you took up these practices. Now in that secondary column, we have faith. And she's putting Christianity into that column and she's saying that uh, Christians put more into faith alone. And um, she elaborates 
on how this, this faith alone way of being in the life of faith, specifically in the life of a Christian, ends up being translated theologically. She says on Roman numeral 12 that spiritual practices don't justify us. They don't save us. Rather, they refine our Christianity. They make the inheritance Christ gives us on the cross more fully our own. And so pulling on that, that term justification and salvation, these are important theological tenets that we as Protestants and Presbyterians would verily uphold that there is not a way in which our practices would claim us as justified before God should we have sinned. The only, the absolutely only Thing that could justify us before God in our sin is the grace of God, the grace of Christ given to us in Jesus. And further, that's linked up directly to salvation. We don't earn our salvation. We are given our salvation through the gift of grace. And our only duty is not necessarily to... Um, practice that, although we'll get into that some more because of course we practice um, grace as Christians, our duty to, to become justified or to be saved is to simply accept that grace. And so we really have kind of two, two sparring sides. It's, it's almost like a works righteousness side is coming up through Lauren Winner's position on Judaism being that of action that engenders faith. And then you have this grace alone, Christ alone, justification by grace alone, contra works righteousness going on. And so that's something that I just noted in the introduction that that's not necessarily parsed out. It's just hinted at. And it's something that we as Christian readers of her book, I think, need to be attentive to and work to parse out together. So we will do more of that as we take up each of the practices in each chapter that we explore together. And um, then finally, she closes the introduction with a bold statement. She, she posits that the benefit of us as Christians taking up these spiritual disciplines would make us better disciples. And she says, practicing the spiritual disciplines does not make us Christians. Instead, the practicing teaches us what it means to live as Christians. There is an etymological clue here. Disciple is related to the word discipline. The ancient disciplines form us to respond to God over and over always in gratitude, in obedience, and in faith. So that is a quick summary of some of the main points given in her introduction. To which my primary question was, is it helpful to think about discipleship in superlative terms? Which is to say, uh, you know, if we can become better disciples, as she's boldly claiming, is that even a helpful way to look at our own Christianity in terms of good, better, and best, or on the on the converse side of that, bad, worse, and worst. And so I think lurking in the background of such a claim that you could become a better Christian by taking up these spiritual practices is a problematic presupposition. Um, and it's problematic in that it doesn't promote a healthy theology. 
I do not personally believe, and I think there are other theologians that would stand with me in making the claim that there's no such thing as best um, in, in a theological sense um, for yourself. Uh, there's there's only what we can do with all things considered, wherein we would be doing our best. And there's no objective sort of best that exists out there in the universe that we're seeking to achieve. Um, this being the objective, us being the subjective, trying to, to always get to that superlative it's really quite relative and we work within what we are subjected to in our being to do our best so um owning that best is quite important it needs to be a personal best now Related to that is this idea that perfectionism is a distinctly Protestant poison. Maybe not for you, and if you are not among those of uh, the Presbyterian faith who have been brought up with intense perfectionistic tendencies, then I would consider you to be uh, one of the one of the lucky few. But I do believe that it's sort of somehow wrapped up into Protestant thinking and somehow in Presbyterian particularity. And I'm not sure exactly where that comes from, but in all of the churches I have served and all of the Presbyterians I've met, it's sort of been um, an underpinning present for most of the faith. Um, and so uh, along with that ideal that there is a perfect way of being comes a disillusion a disillusion that there is a saintly state of being that is achievable with just the right formula of discipline. That would be that objective best that we might all be striving for if we were to believe that we could become perfect in a spiritual discipline. And to that I would say saintly states are not externally determined and then grafted onto our own internal states as an objective to be sought after. We work with our own limitations. As I was saying earlier, we work with the subjective reality within which we operate. We work with our personal best. And within our personal best, there are, of course, going to be certain limitations. And those limitations don't come as evaluative. Certain limitations are not necessarily good, better, or best, bad, worse, or worst. They just are. And God accepts us as we are, flaws and all, limitations and all, excellencies and personal bests all rolled into one. And so I, I believe that if we're going to, to look at becoming a better disciple, for example, by taking up a spiritual practice, it's incredibly important to put a scale of progress in view with this kind of theological presupposition in place. And the presupposition is that we would accept ourselves as we are and challenge ourselves within our own limitations. And an example of that, to root it for you, if this is all too theoretical, would be expecting someone with severe ADHD to pray unceasingly, as some Christians would suggest uh, a, a prayerful saint would do, even a prayer warrior might do, is unrealistic. For someone with the limitation of ADHD, such a goal might even be impossible. And then that could create a sort of um, failure mentality for that individual where feelings of rejection or inability or even um, 
incorrect creation, somehow they weren't made right to achieve these saintly and godly goals, those kinds of, of brands of thinking can start to creep in and deeply affect the spirit in a really negative way that I don't think accords with how God would would expect us and would want us to love ourselves and challenge ourselves to become better disciples. So setting a more realistic goal that considers a given limitation sets a disciple up for success. In the case of the ADHD beloved disciple, praying unceasingly is not necessarily going to happen. So setting a goal of praying three minutes every other day might be a more realistic example of how to, within one's own limitations, achieve a personal best. So if we're going to talk about granting grace to our own personal limitations, we have to then do that with the caveat that we can't just skip over challenges that ask us to grow, challenges that are hard and feel bad. They maybe even feel like they're the worst. Um, those feelings that are negative are separate from the evaluative sort of merit that those challenges do bring. And the evaluative merit is always good. It is good to challenge yourself to grow with God. So um, in terms of granting yourself grace, that doesn't look like just skipping over an opportunity to challenge yourself. Um, there may be some things, of course, that after you have put in concerted effort to take up a new spiritual discipline, you may find that that doesn't work for you, given your limitations, but you've tried it and you've tried it unceasingly or on a routine basis, you know, uh, three minutes every two two days kind of thing. You know, you've tried that for a month or two months or even a year and you're just not feeling it. I think, you know, when you get to that kind of point with a spiritual discipline, it's okay to say that's not for me. Um, and in that sense, it's okay to stop challenging yourself, but I do believe that it is incredibly worthwhile and important for us to challenge ourselves instead of falling prey to our own limitations. And spiritual disciplines offer ways for us to grow with God, and that is a way in which we will become better disciples. And that, of course, needs to be done within healthy limits. The second issue that Dr. Winner's introduction raises has to do with the necessity of spiritual practices. In a reformed line of thinking, in a reformed theology, wherein grace by faith is robustly affirmed, there isn't a requirement that one obey certain spiritual practices in order to secure their faith. That's the whole point of justification by faith alone. And um, the reformers argued to some extent during the, the Great Reformation that um, those kinds of practices almost distracted from the central tenets of the faith. And they were famous for the five sole, uh, which I would encourage you to look up, a few of which are grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. Those are three of the five, suggesting that we didn't need any external uh, vehicles to access our faith or to better our faith. It was simpler than such practices might suggest. And so I think when we're looking at uh, spiritual practices and disciplines, it's important to consider the context within which reformers were contesting such types of discipline. 
because at that time the papacy was completely corrupted and they morphed Christianity into an entirely man-made machine that was no longer about Jesus Christ. It was about money and power. And the reformers rebelled against the works righteousness that the papacy was really endorsing. Um, and they warned Christians of the bankruptcy in a works righteousness model, which a justification by grace alone model would have worked against. Um, those warnings came about because they were terrified that folks were going to lose their place in heaven, lose their salvation, lose their justification by putting the promises of God into bankrupt promises of the papacy. And so they were deeply concerned about where justification was found for the people. And so we've inherited that tradition, but I think it is also important to consider that there's another tradition that in Reformed theology often gets overlooked. And it's something that Dr. Winner is giving a nod to in her introduction, and she's doing this um, implicitly throughout her book in suggesting that we take a look at sanctification. Now, those are part and parcel of uh, sort of one theological package, which is justification and sanctification. But in order to first really access um, the import of practices, spiritual disciplines, like the ones she's putting before us, I think it's important to understand that though these disciplines and practices were not um, suggested as necessary and would definitely not have been suggested as necessary by reformers, there's still merit there that even a reformer would have understood and would have encouraged. The reformed context does color how we see disciplines, however, because in some sense they're contraindicated by reformed principles like the five sole. Um, again, I'm trying to flesh out the limitations of those contraindications to say that there is actually a lot of merit there if you properly contextualize the way in which works righteousness was railed against. It was railed against as a method of justification. And we're justified by faith alone. That doesn't then rule out the need for or the desire for or the room for spiritual disciplines in our Christian lives. Taking that another step further, it's also important to look at how there are some anti-Judaic sentiments present in some forms of Christianity. And um, we're clearly looking at, as Dr. Winner uh, explicitly states over and over in her book that these are Jewish practices and she thinks that these are Judaic rituals that um, Hebrews practice better than Christians. And I think, um, you know, lurking in the background of, of some Christian thinking, especially of a former era, is the thought that um, because we received a new covenant in Christ Jesus, all of the old covenants put forth in the Hebrew Bible were rendered moot. They're no longer applicable and they might as well be tossed out the window. And so there are some interpreters of the Bible who look exclusively to the New Testament for the gospel and um, do not work through the covenants of old as though they have a grasp or a grip on our spiritual lives. And that kind of thinking has um, its own title. It's called supersessionism. Another thing I'd encourage you to look up alongside the five soli. Um, and it, it's in line with the thinking that the 
<coughs> that the Old Testament was rendered moot once we received the New Testament. And so uh, that might be one of the few times you hear me say the term Old Testament. I'm very intentional about using the term Hebrew Bible to root out any kind of supersessionist thinking from my theological speech because it's not an old covenant that is made up into a biblical corpus that is a moot testimony. In fact, it is a wealth of knowledge about how our Christian God operated throughout history to inform us about who our God is and how our God loves us and has loved us. And I believe that that testimony throughout that entire biblical corpus is further affirmed by the New Testament. And so um, that is a very, very short version of some of my biblical theology, which is definitely the subject matter of a different course. But um, boiling it down simply to say that the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament have to be read together. One can't be tossed out the window with the other just uplifted as the singular truth is important to understand. And I think for, for folks who may be struggling with the idea that the Old Testament is still relevant, it's important to simply accept the fact that there is an historical reality in Jesus' Judaism. So he was a rabbi, he was a Jew, and he was taught the scriptures of old. He was brought up as a Hebrew, and he was brought up to understand the Hebrew scriptures. And so what he came to do, and this is in the New Testament, he came to reform, not to abolish the law. So a very simple answer to a very complicated question, which is how the two testament testaments relate to one another is that one is a reformed version of the other. Um, we get a new reformed version of the old in Christ Jesus. And so, like I said, that's a very short way to resolve the issue of supersessionism, but I do think it's important to address here because Supersessionism could be lurking in the background of some of your thinking as you're approaching Dr. Winner's book, thinking, you know, we don't need these Jewish rituals or practices because we have Jesus. Well, there's still plenty that we can learn, not just from things that Jews did better, as Dr. Winner suggests, but um, there's something that we can learn from our forefathers and mothers in faith that uh, is not just um, ritualistic and um, pertinent to the, the specifications of Hebraic law. It is equally as important for us today because there are golden nuggets of truth in there of God's beautiful actions in history and um, his promises, his identity, his loving kindness towards us. Um, there's so much in there in Jewish scriptures and ritual and history that we can then grow with and learn from as Christians to better understand our own God and therefore our own faith. And so I believe that with a proper biblical theology in place, one that isn't supersessionist, and a proper theology in place, which understands that sanctification is still important, um, we can enter into Dr. Winner's conversation a little bit uh, more open-mindedly um, and to start to hear what she has to say about the necessity, the possible necessity for spiritual practices 
while understanding that they are not just going to be thrown out because they suggest works righteousness. They're not going to be thrown out because they um, stink of old laws and old covenants, which we've replaced. Um, there's still plenty of merit. There's opportunity for sanctification, and there is opportunity to um, really integrate the biblical corpus and teachings um, in a way that's challenging, but very rewarding. And I think that that is in large part what she's trying to do is to get us to start to see how we might be able to challenge our understanding of old biblical rituals that um, we might not have previously considered. Dr. Winner's first chapter, Shabbat, or Sabbath, is putting forth an understanding of Sabbath as observed in Orthodox Judaism. And within such an Orthodox observance, there are much stricter laws around Sabbath rest. There's a long list of thou shalts and thou shalt nots, and she speaks on those briefly, um, even saying that there are 39 thou shalt nots. Uh, at the heart of or at the center of these lists and laws and rituals is the idea that um, Sabbath is about taking a rest from creation, from creating. And that harkens back to God's creation of the world in Genesis, where he created for six days and rested on the seventh. So that, that biblical illusion is clear, but it's also important in her setup of Sabbath to say that it's not just uh, strict observance of the law to do this, that, and the other thing and not do this, that, and the other thing. It's really about um, a way of being that's restful and observant of restfulness from creation. Um, and in that way of being, she does say when she's posing how a friend who went over to uh, some, some folks' house for dinner on the Sabbath, that, that guest was asking, why do these rules matter? And the host responds by saying on page seven, when we cease interfering in the world, we are acknowledging that it is God's world. I love this quote because it captures the centrality of creation in uh, the observance of Sabbath. And um, I think that is, is central to Lauren Winner's thesis here about Sabbath as well, that it's about creation, not just how the world was created, but how God intended it and how we were created. And um, she's in, in an implicit manner arguing that we were created to rest. And so um, further contextualizing that rest, She's also talking about um, the ritual marking of the Sabbath end, which is called Havdalah. And part of the reason that ritual exists is to help to prepare those observing the Sabbath for the transition out of the day set apart, out of the holy day of rest, into the normalcy of a week ahead. Um, and so she says something beautiful about that. And uh, she says it on page eight, um, that an extra soul comes to dwell in you on the Sabbath, but departs once the week begins. And this spirit, uh, she, she then continues to say is, Holy. It's a holy spirit. 
Um, and she uses the definition of holy as set apart to further explain that indwelling of the spirit, that in setting apart a day of rest, we are able to experience holiness as it was intended. And in that state of holiness or being set apart, we then invite in a spirit. So although she's not drawing these connections, I am. And I think that it's not just a day apart, but it's a day set apart to invite in the Holy Spirit. And um, you invite it in not just to your dwelling place and to your house, but you invite it into your entire being. And then she further uh, clarifies what she means by this way of being, resting from creation, living in a different spirit, by, by really pointing the orientation of the Sabbath towards God, not simply towards the cessation of everyday routines and behaviors and um, the taking up of certain religious rituals. It's not just about that. It's really about setting apart that day, making it holy, and orienting it entirely towards God. And then she talks briefly about what she calls a new Sabbath vogue. And um, she's talking about uh, stuff that I'm sure all of you have heard of, experienced, and indulged in yourself um, in, you know, some, some built-in time off that's become a cultural norm in order to do two things that she argues aren't oriented towards God at all. And so they misuse the notion of Sabbath entirely. One is a capitalist justification, which would say that um, it's important to take time off so you can be more productive. And the second is a self-indulgent uh, sort of reward for time off. When you take a bubble bath, you are indulging in and relishing in time strictly to yourself. And so, um, you know, though those things are lauded in culture, they're are not uh, for any religious purpose and ought not to be misappropriated as such. Um, and then she continues on to sort of close out the chapter by saying, um, you know, what does a Christian Sabbath look like then? It's not these Sabbath vogues um, that have become sort of trendy by virtue of uh, cultural upbuilding of such indulgences and practices. And it doesn't need to look like a full-on appropriation of the Jewish ritual observance of the Sabbath. We don't need to now become Orthodox Jews in order to borrow from the practice of Sabbath to really get something meritous out of it. Um, and so she answers, answers the question of what a Christian Sabbath might look like by giving a couple of examples of how she's now appropriating it um, or working it into her own life. And um, then she closes out the chapter. So she, I think, raises more questions than she uh, gives answers. And um, the first question that, that comes to my mind is, um, okay, Lauren, you shared a couple of things that uh, you're now doing that help you to observe Sabbath as a Christian, but um, it still doesn't answer the question for me, what does this discipline look like for Christians? And um, We've already clarified that it's not a Sabbath vogue. Um, and I think it's it's fair to say that for most of us, it wouldn't be an entire day's time. Um, that's asking quite a lot. I'll speak a little more on that in just a moment. Um, so then what is it? Uh, 
again, back to it being an entire day's time, I think that uh, setting aside an entire day to God is a big ask for us in our contemporary setting. Um, modern Christians, uh, although I think most of us would benefit from an entire day's time retreating with God, we kind of save that length of time for things like actual retreats. Taking out one full day to be with God, to rest from creation, is so uh, against the grain for us. And we're so, as a society and as an American culture, um, geared towards productivity and things of that nature that taking out that much time is an unrealistic ask. And so I don't hear her suggesting that. Um, and I think also part of what works into that is the Protestant work ethic. Uh, that there's much to be said on that, but I think that that is sort of intrinsic to a Presbyterian way of living life. And so taking an entire day off um, needs to maybe do something like she suggests in the Sabbath Vogue, like... Uh, allowing us to then become more productive so that what we then go to produce might be able to be used for the furtherance of God's kingdom. Anyway, I think there's um, a limit to how much time we might be able to actually commit to the spiritual discipline of Sabbath and recognizing that's important. Um, so, you know, even if it's not an entire day, it is clearly some kind of time that's set aside, holy, set apart to be with God. And what I think it really is, is more like, instead of what she's suggesting as a Sabbath vogue, I think it's more like what I'm going to call a meditation vogue. Um, there's so many terms out there now that have become commonplace. They're just part of our way of speaking. Um, we hear things like being present, uh, practicing mindfulness, or living in the moment. And all of those phrases have become part of our vocabulary because they capture a certain sentiment. And what that sentiment is, is that we are so busy with so much in our lives. Our lives are so full. We're inundated. We're flooded with clutter in our minds and in our spirits. Um, simple example, simply going to the grocery store to choose a dressing. We are inundated with choice. There are so many brands, so many versions of one style of dressing, one recipe that maybe in a former age, you would have had two choices instead of 15. Small example, but we are inundated with choice and that clutters the mind. That's one way in which our contemporary setting has caused this clutter to really distract us from being centered, not being present, um, not being able to practice mindfulness or living in the moment. Um, we make thousands of decisions every day. So that's one way in which our minds become cluttered, but there are certainly plenty more. I mean, there's, there's emotional and physical duress that takes our minds away from being present, from being mindful, from being aware of the now, if you will. Uh, we can't tap into a meditative state with all this clutter present. And um, the idea of this meditation vogue is that we would be able to set aside the clutter. We might be able to have holy moments to just be. And um, I think that for Christians, that state of being where we would set aside all of the distractions and be able to sit in the spirit to just be is reflective of a triune theology. Allow me to elaborate. 
um, those moments of being present to just be plays with the verb to be, which is also biblically relevant. Throughout the entire Bible, we understand Yahweh Adonai as the great I am. The same verb is present. God identifies as I am. We can therefore identify with our Lord in moments of just being. And, you know, if that's not really doing it for you, this, this idea of being related to the great I am, there's further evidence to that in our creation. Our very being is wholly dependent on our creation, a gift given to us from our beloved creator. And so by our very existence, we are connected with God and taking time to set apart uh, presence with that being is part of our call as Christians to practice reverence for creation, to practice Shabbat, if you will. Um, but that's sort of the God element of this triune theology I'm going to lay out for you that I think can be found in a meditative vogue. Um, I think there's a secondary presence that we can find in those moments where we're centered on um, the great I am, when we're centered on just being. And I think that's our Savior's love and grace, which is a gift we receive through Christ's being. And when we tap into our being and just our sheer being and our sheer existence, we can identify with those gifts. Allow me to elaborate a little bit. Um, the incarnation is famously fully human and fully divine. It is a way in which and the one time in history wherein the body and flesh were united wholly with spirit and mind. And so in the very incarnate being of Christ Jesus, we were given an example of what it's like to unite the heart and the mind, the body with the spirit. And um, part of Christ's paradigmatic presence on this earth was setting an example for how we might live. And so his example, surely in existing as the incarnate, is a challenge to us to tap into a space of our own created being that is in some way incarnate. Our bodies house this spirit, and if we're living strictly in the physical, how are we ignoring the spirit? And so Christ being incarnate is an invitation for us to tap into our own spirit. That might sound really mystic, and um, in some sense it's meant to be. Uh, Myth mystics do describe mountaintop moments uh, when they've transcended their limited way of being, limited to a physical way of being, when they have tapped into that spirit. And so I'm not talking about having a mountaintop moment. I'm talking about um, being at the foot of the mountain and, and working your way up to that and just sort of trying to commune with that spirit. Now, I talked a little bit about how that spirit is godly. It is akin to Christ Jesus. And now I will finish out the triune theology there by saying that um, in communing with that spirit, we're communing with none other than the Holy Spirit. And I drew that connection before in Dr. Winner's um, description of how 
the Sabbath invites in a new spirit within you. And I would argue that that is, of course, the Holy Spirit, which is one with Christ and our great creator. So I think there's a triune way of being present. There's a very distinctly Christian way of being present that might allow us to really tap into some kind of Sabbath practice that looks something like meditation or prayer. Um, that is time we set apart to be present with God. It needn't be an entire day. It needn't be a Zen sit. It needn't be a prayer or a meditative practice. Specifically, I think there are lots of ways that we can be present with our Christian God. And um, that can happen in community. It can certainly happen in worship. It can happen at the table in Christian fellowship. It can happen in singing and walking, in eating and revelry. Um, it's not always set to a timer as time apart in solitude. And so I'm suggesting all of this to sort of push back on the ideology that Sabbath has to be set apart so completely from the reality which we live into every day. There are ways that we can weave it into our own lives and do so with intentionality to be present in a triune manner. And so for me, that is really the heart of what this Christian practice would be and could become for us as Christian readers is it's about setting an intention. It's about seeking moments throughout the week to absorb the great I am. It's about a time set apart. Um, it's a time set apart to absorb that presence, to sit still in that presence and that might be a fleeting moment that you experience in community at table while you're having dinner with friends but it may also be a time set apart intentionally for the practice of being in a triune way regardless of how um, you would take up that intention in ways that would work for you and with you given your own limitations and your own way of being. I do believe that um, it's clear that it needs to be a practice and a discipline. And so it's not an intention that we set and then release. It's an intention that we would be serious about, then practice and um, practice regularly. And so I think now more than ever, we have a great call to take up this idea of Sabbath rest as we are all set apart in our own homes and to not only ponder, but maybe begin to practice some form of Sabbath, setting Sabbath intentions and allowing that to evolve naturally and prayerfully into something that can be life-giving for you as some rest for, from creation um, and allow you time to commune with the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus, and our God on high. And so I invite you to consider ways in which that may be a blessing for you. Um, and I also welcome feedback to hear your thoughts on what that might look like for you. Um, I'm really anxious to hear. And so blessings on your Sabbath journeys this holy week. Next week, we will take back up Dr. Winner's book in chapters two and three. Chapter two is fitting food. Chapter three is on morning, and we will explore those in greater depth next Thursday. Again, blessings to you and yours. Peace be with you.